Let's as always start with an update of the Starship development at Boca Chica. Then we must of course talk about the giant floating ocean Starship ports, right? Come on, everyone is talking about it, so we must too. And what's up with this weird robot dog at Boca Chica? And we also have the first pictures of the Starlink UFO user terminal. Then believe it or not, the space shuttle, I mean the SLS boosters, now arrived at Kennedy Space Center for the upcoming Artemis 1 launch in 2021. Meanwhile, the new chief of human spaceflight at NASA, Kathy Leaders, starts her new position by emphasizing that getting to the moon by 2024 will be a real tough challenge. No sh**, Kathy? Well, at least the Perseverance rover is still on schedule for the launch to Mars on July 17th. And then exoplanets. Yes, it's time to talk about exoplanets again. Not only has a mirror image of the Earth-Sun system been discovered, no, a new paper suggests that as many as 5 billion Earth-like rocky planets are circling G-type stars in the habitable zone. And we all know what that means, right? That's right, aliens! So according to a new study, it's highly likely there are a few dozens of them in our galaxy. A lot to talk about, so stay tuned! So then, what's currently going on at Boca Chica? Well, a lot as always. Last week, the Starship SN7 tank prototype underwent a few cryogenic pressure tests. And what looked like another tank pop actually turned out to be a quite good test result. A big thank you to Lab Padre for these amazing shots. And we recommend you to also check out his YouTube channel, link in the description. As Elon said on Twitter, the Starship tank reached a pressure of 7.6 bar and actually didn't burst, only leaked. More so, the tank was built from 304L stainless steel instead of the normal 301 steel. A leak before a burst is a highly desirable test result. We know that the final goal should be around 8.5 bar because that is the required threshold to have Starship human rated. The new alloy based on the 304L stainless steel, which Elon said SpaceX is developing themselves, should get us to 8.5 bar. So while SN7 has been repaired and will undergo a second round of cryo pressure tests, both the SN5 and SN6 large scale prototypes are assembled to the same degree and are waiting in the High Bay Assembly Building. Thanks by the way to Mary aka Boca Chica Gal from nasaspaceflight.com for these amazing shots here. We also recommend you to check out their channel, link in the description. It is really fascinating to see two starships being assembled in parallel. The question now, of course, is which prototype will do what. We assume that the SN5 will soon be carried to the test stand, then the usual procedure of wet dress and static fires, followed by hopefully the first hopping attempts. Should all go well, we'd see the 150 meter hopping test by the end of the week or next week. SN6, we assume, will be the first Starship prototype to be fully assembled since the MK1. Initially, SN5 should have been that prototype, but then SN4 popped, therefore it's likely that SN6 will now assume that role and perform the 20 km high hopping tests with subsequent skydiving maneuver. And since SpaceX now goes all in Starship and is even preparing for super heavy development, with the newly planned gigantic 80 meter something tall super heavy high bay, we think the chances are looking pretty good to see the first Starship orbital test flights by the end of 2020 or in early 2021. Talking of super heavy, recently Elon brought forth again the idea of floating Starship spaceports, which we were already shown in 2017 for the first time. Now Elon clarified it a bit more on Twitter stating that the Super Heavy class spaceport will indeed be able to support a full Starship with Super Heavy, with destinations like Mars, the Moon 
or hypersonic Earth-to-Earth -Earth travel. SpaceX is now even hiring offshore operation engineers for that purpose in Brownsville, where the Boca Chica Starship facility is located. The reason behind this is not only to allow for higher versatility when launching and landing starships and super heavies, but of course, it also has to do with politics. If the lobbyists who want to see SpaceX and Starship fail manage to bribe enough politicians in Congress and would be so stupid as to hinder SpaceX from launching and landing Starships and Super Heavies from US soil, then SpaceX could just float Starship and Super Heavy to international waters where US law doesn't apply anymore. Then bam! Problem solved. So with the floating spaceports, SpaceX would get a higher independence from any national state, which is quite excellent, because you know that national states are ruled by politicians, which are sometimes, hmm, shall we say euphemistically, not the brightest on this planet. So that SpaceX can pursue their Mars and Moon plans without any political interference. Pure genius. And it seems that the age of robots has now begun at Boca Chica, with Lab Pajo having made these recordings here, showing us the robot dog named Zeus in action. He even has his small cute little dog house. So is this a first sign of the impending robot apocalypse? Is this the evil robot dog from Black Mirror, which at some point is going to kill us all? And no, it's a Boston Dynamics spot. We think that SpaceX uses the dock for monitoring the launch pad from up close, which is dangerous to humans, but not for our robot friend here, because he sports 360 degree cameras, noise level detectors, and thermal sensors. Therefore, it can monitor Starship and find possible leaks from up close, much better than humans can, and thus possibly reducing the probability of an unwanted disassembly of another Starship prototype. It's really cool to see SpaceX starting to work together with other innovative companies and we are pretty sure that we are also going to see some of these Boston Dynamics robots in use on the Moon and on Mars. And then believe it or not, but the first pictures of the Starlink user interface have been shot by a Reddit user called DarkPenguin22. Thanks a lot for these cool photos DarkPenguin22. So then it's confirmed that the user terminal will indeed look like a UFO on a stick as Elon indeed said some time ago on Twitter. Starlink will enter the public beta around October with a regular launch for North American customers in early 2021. And if that cool looking UFO user antenna is not another reason for using Starlink, then we don't know what is. Meanwhile, over at Artemis, things are progressing at breakneck speeds too. Okay, now seriously, at least these old Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters arrived at Kennedy Space Center. Sorry, of course I meant the SLS boosters. How could I confuse them with the totally different Space Shuttle boosters? In any case, the SLS boosters arrived at KSC, where they will be prepared to launch Artemis 1. In 2021. You didn't really think that Artemis 1 would still launch this year, did you? That would be far too fast for Boeing's taste. No, we need to drag the launch out to 2021 to further suck out some dollars from NASA. That's how it's done. Look here, SpaceX noobs. That's how you suck out money from NASA. <laughs> Okay, sorry, we got carried away a bit again, but SLS is every time such an emotional topic. It's really hard to remain neutral on SLS every time we talk about it. It's, it's really hard. Well, maybe the new chief of human spaceflight, Kathy Leaders, can accelerate things a bit more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, after one week in her new position, she already starts to kind of make excuses of how hard and difficult it will be to land on the moon by 2024. She said, quote, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I knew the answer. It would make my job a lot easier. We are going to try. You need to start. One step at a time, right? 
If you say I can't get there, well, you are not going to get there. If things come up along the way where technically it takes us longer, we will go figure it out. But right now, the team is trying. It is tough. Well, yes, it is of course tough. Of course it's not easy. Who said flying to the freaking moon was going to be easy? You know, back in the 60s, after Kennedy announced the goal to land astronauts on the moon in his famous speech, did we hear excuses from NASA? Sure, it was hard, but that was the whole point. You know, doing it not because it's easy, but because it is hard. So we hope that leaders won't fold like Doc Lovero after he realized how difficult it would be to achieve the goal. We need you to stay strong, Kathy. You, you can do it. I think Kathy is ripe for the Shia LaBeouf motivational treatment. Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success while you're gonna wake up and work hard at it! Nothing is impossible! You should get to the point where anyone else would quit and you're not gonna stop there! No! What are you waiting for? Do it! Now off to the moon! But believe it or not, there's one thing that didn't get delayed at NASA. James Webb? <laughs> Please. Of course it has been delayed. See our last week's video on details about that. No, we mean the Perseverance rover. Believe it or not, it really is still on track for a launch to Mars on the 17th of July. And why is this mission so extremely important? Well, fortunately we talked about it in this video here, link in the description. But this is the short version. Because it will search for life on Mars. Hmm? Did I hear aliens? Yes, we haven't talked about exoplanets for quite a while now. For example, an almost exact Earth-Sun system has been discovered 3000 light years away. The planet with the cool name, KOI 456.04. KOI, standing for a Kepler object of interest, circles its parent star, Kepler 160, in the habitable zone. But what's really cool is that Kepler 160 is a Sun twin, meaning a G-type star, with almost exactly the same mass, size, and luminosity as our Sun. Okay, the planet itself is quite a lot larger than Earth, with almost twice the diameter. Thus, at the same density, it's around 8 times as massive. So it's a super-Earth. But further observations are necessary to 100% confirm that this planet is real and not only just a statistical fluke. But according to a new paper, there could be around 5 billion such planets in the galaxy alone. Because there are 400 billion stars in the galaxy, with 7% of them being G-type stars like the Sun, and with Kepler data estimates, we arrive at the number of 5 billion such planets. And since the Sun is a friendly star, it is reasonable to assume that other rocky planets in the habitable zone around such stars will be more likely to develop life than for example rocky planets that circle red dwarf stars. Red dwarfs are much more violent when they are young, thus showering their planets with quite intense radiation. Therefore, planets around G-type stars might be more likely to host life. And according to a new study, also published in the Astrophysical Journal, there could be around 36 technological alien civilizations in the galaxy right now, taking the parameters we currently know into account. And the lower limit is only a handful of civilizations, around 4, while the upper limit is around 200. That's quite a bandwidth, of course, but the problem is that we don't yet exactly know all the parameters. The leaders of the study basically took the currently available Kepler telescope data of how many rocky planets could probably harbor life in the galaxy, which are huge numbers as we previously stated, and took into account that it needs around 5 billion years for intelligent life to form. So basically the time it took here on Earth. Although we have to say that debate is still ongoing whether humans can really be classified as an intelligent species.
taking into account an average lifetime of civilizations of at least 100 years, where they would transmit signals, we find that the most likely number of intelligent civilizations is a few dozens. However, this means that on average, they would be 17,000 light years apart from each other, which in turn means that there is no freaking chance that we would ever hear signal from such a civilization. Because over such vast distances, we could only hear a very high-powered radio beam pointed directly towards us. Our radio transmissions are so weak that they even cannot be picked up anymore at a distance of only a few light years. And what are the chances that one of those, let's say 30 civilizations, has pointed giant super powerful antennas exactly towards us at exactly the right time and using exactly the right transmission technology, namely radio waves. Therefore, it's no surprise to us at all that we have an apparent big silence. But this topic goes so much deeper that we have to dedicate an entire episode to it. Some of our first videos ever actually deal with this topic. You can watch them right here, link in the description. But be warned, the cringe factor is really extremely high. We ourselves cannot even watch them anymore. You have been warned, but we will of course talk more about this absolutely interesting topic in a special Friday episode. So what do you say to SpaceX's genius idea with the floating Starship spaceports? I mean, that's a freaking genius, right? And what do you think about the progress of the Artemis program? Will Kathy be able to accelerate it? I hope so. And when do you think that Artemis 1 will be launched? And currently we are doing a video series on whether we should first colonize the Moon or Mars. And if you are interested, you can watch it right here. So then thanks for watching the JS Space Report and as always, on to the future. <laughs> just, just do it!